everyone for um yeah giving up your time to come to this talk i hope it's of interest i um yeah th thanks for all the introductions i really wanted to get a sense of who i was talking to because I, I think i'll adjust it slightly at different points I, and i didn't want to make assumptions or carry on going over material that people would be familiar with um so thank you for that uh just to, to kick off at the start this i wanted to give a bit of context so this um research most of what i'm going to talk about today was funded in an unusual way via a levy hume prize award so it meant i was given an award mm -hmm. and quite a lot of flexibility as to what i actually focused on and i did a huge amount of data collection and then got slightly drowned in the amount of data that I generated. So it has taken me a while to get a relatively clear narrative uh, as to what this data tells us. And there are a huge amount of people involved in this process. Anna McIntyre, who's on the call, is one of those people who's helped a lot with the analysis, but all of the others are listed here. And these are all people that either helped with the data collection, running the citizens' juries or the survey, or with the analysis. So thanks to everyone. Um, yeah, so the, to situate the work, I my initial projects that I undertook were all about understanding how evidence on health inequalities influence policy, what how the evidence had traveled into policy, why certain evidence seemed to get more policy traction and more policy influence um, than others and, and why that didn't match the kind of um, researchers perspective on the evidence that should be getting the most traction and so on. So that that's one bit of my work. And then there's also I've continued doing work around understanding the problem of health inequalities and, and ideas and research that are going on in that field. Most recently in this book on the unequal pandemic, looking at health inequalities in the context of COVID-19 with Claire and Julia. And the work I'm talking about today is, is kind of builds on both of these two strands in different ways. So during the time that I've been in this field, there's been, in some ways, it's like quite a depressing field because you keep coming up against the headlines that are about why the fact that health inequalities are getting worse. And, and um, yeah, and so it, it seems like we're not in a, in a brilliantly a br progressive kind of trajectory, although there is some research to suggest now that some aspects of health inequalities did reduce under the new Labour governments from 1997 to 2010. But generally the headlines are much like this. Um, and there was also um, a few years ago, a, a, some audit um, work, which suggested, I mean, it was, it was, the report itself was a bit more nuanced and complex than this, but the headlines were um, reducing the health gap kind of efforts in policy were wasted money because they hadn't been successful. So, that has prompted a lot of questions within the field, um, so reflections on why this is the case. So this is Richard Torton, editor of The Lancet, reflecting on that. So he was always saying the defeat of inequality is an important goal of public health. But although there is this broad consensus, especially since inequalities are deepening, little progress is being made in creating that elusively fairer society. Expert in health inequalities have successfully drawn attention to the social determinants of health, but the explanatory power of social determinants has not fully translated into an actionable manifesto. That disappointing reality should be inviting some difficult questions. And it's kind of in response to this, um, these kind of reflections on the field that a lot of my work has, has, yeah, has attempted to ask some of those questions, I guess. So one of the questions that I tried to ask is, because one of the things that policymakers said when I was interviewing them was health inequalities researchers say a lot about the problem, the causes of what they think the causes of the problem are, pathways and so on, but they don't focus so much on what they think the policy solution should be. So we're not getting clear messages. So I did some research with a colleague called Moore Candler Keltonani, which was specifically asking researchers working on health inequalities in the UK, what they felt policymakers should be doing to tackle health inequalities. There was quite a few, some interesting things that came out of this study. One was that if you ask researchers to answer that question based on their own expert opinion and then you ask it, them to answer the same questions based on their sense of the strength of the available evidence they gave quite different answers um i'm slightly going off on a tangent there this 
this second part of that survey, which was published in that paper, was where we gave people a nominal 100 points and they could attribute those 100 points. They could, they could distribute those 100 points um, across the different policy proposals. The policy proposals that we gave to them came from various um, reviews of the evidence, things like Marmot Review and so on, that were put, designed for policy audiences and putting policy proposals forward, and also earlier interview data that I'd captured. If, if we look at this summary, and I know it's a very small, small text here, but the broad headline is that um, researchers felt that it was the more upstream policies about things like more progressive systems of taxation benefits and so on, and minimum income for healthy living, increasing the proportion of overall government expenditure allocated to early years. These were the things that they thought would be most effective. And that's important. Um, that, that really reflects the research evidence that people have brought together, but people like Marmot and Claire Bamper and so on, um, and wasn't particularly surprising. But it's notable that those policies are not health policies. So they're not policy areas that are controlled by health people in health teams and so on. Um, if I think back to the research that I did that was specifically asking policymakers and researchers about this relationship between evidence and, and policy around health inequalities, what that showed was that most people working on health inequalities in policy settings knew quite a lot about the research evidence. So it had traveled into policy in, in that sense. People had awareness. Um, but ideas around lifestyle behaviors and the role of health services seem to achieve a really persistent policy attraction and influence sort of that went well beyond the level that research would support whereas ideas around material structural change social determinants of health and so on influence the rhetoric but struggled to get beyond that to influence actions and then there were a set of ideas coming from people like Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett that are about psychosocial um, determinants of health and pathways to health and those ideas have been picked up only aspects of those ideas have been picked up in policy and it was the aspects um, that led to things like um, thinking about assets and empowerment but not the aspects that that focus on things like income inequality so again you're seeing the more structural elements kind of get filtered out as, as the research travels into policy um, so I, I was asking people about why that was, and there was a fair, there were fairly consistent, consistent uh, response. There were lots of ideas, but one of the consistent responses was that there was a lack of public support for those more um, economic uh, redistributive kinds of policies. So this policy advisor is saying, even if all the evidence said we must do this, but then again, if there's, there's a whole opinion, national public opinion saying, well, actually, no, we disagree with this approach. As an MP, you would have to, you'd obviously have to weigh that in. And a senior academic who I interviewed a bit earlier, um, this person put it most succinctly, but lots of people said something similar to this. We're not willing to live in societies where there's equality in other domains other than health. So we're not willing to live in societies where there's equality of wealth or equality of income and equality of housing or equality of access to other services. In virtually every other domain of life, we don't want equality. We actually worship inequality. So that was um, the kind of sense that I got from a lot of interviews. And, and between the interviews I did in my PhD and in my postdoc, um, only eight of the 112 people I interviewed so mainly researchers and policymakers, claimed there was any public ap appetite for more egalitarian policies, and no one claimed there was much media or political interest in such policies. So it's clear that the, the public um, were positioned as a barrier, really, to having more evidence-informed policy responses to health inequalities. But yet it was really unclear in most of those interviews what claims about the public were based on. So there's been very little research to explore public understandings of health inequalities and even less about public views on potential policy responses to health inequalities so interviewees who referred to the public almost never linked it to specific empirical evidence uh, and nonetheless they were implicated as being resistant um, to evidence-informed policy responses so they were I, I, walker and colleagues have a term where they talk about um, the public existing as imaginaries given agency and invoked for strategic purposes by actors in policy debates and that's often what seemed like was happening in health inequalities. So in that context, I then decided to look at well, what, what do we know about public perceptions of, and understandings of health inequalities and potential policy responses? Um, and I, I did with Rosemary Anderson this meta-ethnography where I was trying to bring together the, most of the research that had been done was qualitative. So I was trying to bring that together. 
And, and that, um, the kind of headlines for that, findings for that was that there was very limited evidence. So we only identified 17 studies. There've been a few since, um, since then, um, but, but not many. We didn't identify any studies asking people what kinds of policy interventions they would support to reduce health inequalities. There, and there is one other study since then. Um, so me and one other person are kind of working in that area. Um, there's some overlap of methodological variation and differences in, in the findings. So you see people using different methods come up with slightly different answers. Um, all of the in-depth qualitative studies find public explanations of the link between socioeconomic deprivation um, so, or poorer neighbourhoods and poorer health are very much in line with researchers' understandings of the social determinants of health. So, so they talk about those, those kind of links. And I've, so I've tried to summarise, um, had a really messy diagram at first, I've tried to simplify it here, but the things that come up in those qualitative studies, people talk very much about initial conditions, things like unemployment, poor quality and environments, poor housing, and so on. They talk about direct and indirect impacts on health. Um, so they, they talk about um, so, some psychosocial initial starting points, but mainly they talked about psychosocial um, aspects in terms of being pathways that link these material structural aspects to um, health outcomes later on. So things like um, being unemployed or living in poor housing or um, a kind of stressful neighborhood impacts on your own stress, stigma, shame, social networks, and so on. And all of these things impact on mental health, on, on choices you make about lifestyle behaviors, which then impact on, on health. So very much in line with uh, Michael Marmot, social determinants of health, Margaret Whitehead, rainbow model determinants of health kind of approach. There's a, there is a bit of a paradox in that literature in that although people give very clear accounts of how these upstream structural material factors are impacting on their health, when asked about health inequalities or health differences between their neighborhood and another neighborhood or their community and another community, people tended to resist the idea that those health differences existed, even though that's the logical consequence of, of the accounts that they've given. And I, I think there's a range of reasons that some authors have put forward and, and, and uh, as to why this should be the case. I, I, felt, I felt very persuaded that it was partly about um, people trying to resist information that felt really disempowering and, and stigmatizing. And this came, yes, so that's, that's kind of what I was persuaded by. This came up particularly strongly in an article by Avari McKenzie and colleagues um, undertaken in Scotland. Where, so this is an example um, of one of their participants um, talking about encountering evidence of health inequalities in, in newspaper. So nearly every day I'm picking this paper up, I'm reading about life expectancy with me compared to maybe staying down in London, and they're absolutely kicking you in every way they can like. And if you're in a poor area, you'll always be in a poor area. Nobody's going to try and help you out. But if you're in an affluent area, to hell with the rest with apologies for my anglicized reading of that. Um, yeah, so you, you see this sense that, pe that it's very difficult if you're experiencing the brunt of health inequalities, you're, you're at the disadvantage end of that, to kind of engage with that in a way that doesn't just feel like it's adding to stresses and, uh, and impacting negatively on your mental health. Um, yeah, and this, this came out in a few different studies. So. I think it means we have to think very carefully about how we have conversations with public about health inequalities. Um, I, I then decided to undertake some further research on this on, around um, with a very much with a focus on potential solutions. So I wanted to get a clearer sense of what people thought about the evidence informed policy proposals that were emanating from the research community. So. I decided to undertake a national um, representative survey and three citizens juries that were asking these questions. So to, to what extent do members of the British public recognize health inequalities as a problem? What, to what, what do they think causes the problems of health inequalities? To what, what extent do they support different research informed policy proposals for addressing health inequalities? Where do they feel responsibility for addressing them lies? And what types of wider ideas and discourses appear to be um, impacting all of that. So in this talk, I'm going to focus very much on what the people said about the research informed policy proposals, but it does touch on some of the other issues. So, so for the survey, Opinion administered the survey um, and we had 1,540 
participants in, the, in a nationally representative, representative sample. But then we also topped up for Glasgow, Manchester and Liverpool where we were running the juries. So we ended up with a sample of 1,717. Results suggested that around 70% of people were aware that richer people live longer in, in the UK than in poorer communities, but most people didn't then think, if you ask them more specifically about specific uh, non-communicable diseases like heart disease and cancer or mental he health or accidents, people uh, di didn't think that those um, things were, or, or fewer people thought that those things were worse amongst poor communities. So there was a bit of a disjunct there. And those results are remarkably similar to results um, from a 1997 survey, which McIntyre, Sally McIntyre and colleagues wrote up in 2005, which to me seemed odd because that suggests public recognition of health inequalities in some ways hasn't increased since 1997. And there's been a huge amount of policy activity in media coverage since then. So that's something I want to explore in a bit more detail. But for this talk, I'm mainly gonna focus on the data as it relates to what people said about potential policy responses that has emerged from the evidence. And just to give you an example of how we were asking about this, we were using these kind of Likert scales where we're asking people on a scale of one to five, where one represents strongly disagree and five represents strongly agree, indicate the extent to which you believe each of the following 12 policy proposals would reduce health inequalities. Okay, so, and, and then for the analysis, because there's a huge amount of data, one thing we did was to group the different policy proposals. For this, we used Whitehead's um, typology. So she, she says there's four types of responses to health inequalities, uh, policies and actions that strengthen individuals, ones that strengthen communities, ones that are about improving living and working conditions, and ones that are more about health, healthy macro level policies. Because we didn't bring this um, category, typology, into later, we didn't actually have any in the strengths and communities category because they hadn't, um, that, they hadn't emerged in the way we'd identified the proposals. But we did have them in all the other categories. And I'm going to return to that communities point later. So if we categorise them, like, I'm just going to give some real headline findings now. So one of the headline findings is that most respondents supported all of the research informed policy proposals, including in the survey, including ones that um, re the researchers and policymakers I'd interviewed suggested they didn't feel the public supported. Or at they at least supported it in terms of they thought it would impact on reducing health inequalities. So this is increasing the minimum wage, showing significant support, and this is in introducing higher taxes for rich people. Not quite as much support, but still um, the majority of people um, supporting it. If we look at them kind of as their as we categorize them now, and I've tried to use a color coding to make this a little easier. So high support, higher support above four is green, um, lower support is red, and, and then in between is orange. So what we see there is that actually the, the green ones that we get in the national survey responses are around improving living and working conditions. So they are more upstream than I was expecting based on, on policy and researcher perceptions of what the public thought. And you see a quite similar um, pattern in terms of the policies proposals that were strengthening individuals and those were about promoting healthy macro policies. So both a lot of oranges and one red. Um, if we compare the data now to the ones from the citizens juries and just to say a little bit more about those so we undertook three two days citizens juries in July 2016 there was one each in Glasgow Manchester and Liverpool so each jury took place over two consecutive weekdays um, and the full sample includes 56 respondents for all three waves we had um 20 respondents in Glasgow, 19 in Liverpool and 17 in Manchester. Um, we asked participants to complete the same questionnaire as we used in the national survey before they'd started the jury, during the middle and, and then at the end of the jury. We also tried to follow up a year later, but we didn't get enough responses to be able to do much with that data. So for these, um, support was greatest by most measures um, for three for category three proposals. Um, so that that and to that extent, it mirrors um, the national survey results. It's more complicated here. You can see a lot of data because we've got these various different time points. Um, we can still see that these policies were broadly well supported. These things like spending more money on social housing, spend more money on support services, and so on. And then if we look at the um, strengthening individuals and promoting healthy macro policies, we see um, quite a mixed picture. It's, it's um, mi mixed for both of them, but by the time we go to the, if we move to the 
final bit of the juries, which is where we ask jury members to work collectively to rank the policy proposals. We can see there there's a definite shift <coughs> to greater support for the category four proposals and less support for the um, more individual proposals. So the more individual ones are things like providing the public with more health information. The more healthy macro policies are more like introduce higher taxes for rich people, increase the minimum wage and so on. So just to give you an example of what the, this final collective voting exercise looked like, this is some photos. <clears throat> so it's like a sticky wall exercise where people had dots. So they were individually voting. <clears throat> there was two rounds of dots, which is why you've got two different colors there. You've got the orangey red ones and the green ones. Um, and they were voting on proposals. They, they were voting on the proposals that we'd put to them, which were the ones included in the survey, plus any additional proposals that they'd come up with themselves during the two day citizens juries. After the first round of um, voting, we moved the bits of sheets of paper around to kind of have a ranking. We then reflected on it as a group. People then voted again, and then we, and then we had our final ranking. So the final ranking in terms of the top five proposals look like this. And um, the key, I think a key thing for me was that, that so many of these proposals were in that category four level. They were, they, they were many proposals here that are about upstream economic macro level policies. Spending more money on the NHS is still doing well, and um, particularly in Liverpool. But apart from that, they're mainly these more macro level economic type policies. Um, I also wanted to flag, in terms of the additional proposals that jury participants did develop, they tended to be in at category three and category four. There was a couple in category two, but they came up with very few additional proposals in category one. So there was much more kind of, I suppose, interest in developing proposals that were more upstream. And now I'm just going to give a bit more sense of, of the discussions that went on in the juries by looking at some of the extracts from the qualitative data. Um, so in terms of this proposal to provide the public with more health information, I was expecting this to be um, broadly supported and not to have uh, a huge amount of challenge from people. Um, and it was challenged more than I was expecting, I'd say. So, so it, it was rarely contested, but there was some variation in how people um, framed it. So this person's saying, I, I think a wee bit more education for some people to instead of taking their kids to McDonald's and spending £10 or £15 on that, they could buy a bag of shopping, buy fresh fruit, fresh veg and go somewhere. So if they actually had that bit of background on how to make these things, it would maybe help them. And the facilitator says, do you know, does anyone want to add to that? And a second participant says, I agree with that because it talks about education, which I think is the fundamental. It's the level that you educate people. It allows them to make the right choice with whatever resources they've got. The more money that's thrown at education across the board and the earlier it starts. Education, it underpins everything else. It underpins everything we do. It informs our choices. It explains your actions. It does everything. Unless you have it, you don't really have much. And I think what we see here is, is a shift between um, so the second person is talking about education in a much broader sense. And, and then that isn't really the way that we'd intended this policy proposal, but that's how they'd interpreted it. So they then are, are supporting it, but actually we felt that when we were analyzing that they're supporting quite a different type of policy proposal to this, uh, the one that, that the first participant had been responding to. So yeah, it, it didn't, um, it wasn't controversial, but it was interpreted in different ways by different people. Um, when it comes to, came to something like smoking, investing more in smoking cessation services, which had been a key policy approach under new labor in trying to tackle health inequalities with some evidence that had a minor impact, um, support was relatively low within the jury. It wasn't very prominent, but where it was referred to, people tended to question its potential impact and they often draw on personal experiences to, to do that. And this was despite the fact they'd heard from an expert witness who stressed the importance of um, smoking cessation. It's part of efforts to reduce health inequalities. So this is an example of someone doing that. So the, the thing I was wondering about, putting all these services and things to help people. Now I know quite a lot of smokers. My husband was a heavy smoker. A lot of the people I know like to smoke. So would these services be of any use? My husband certainly died at 51 years of age, but he was a 60 a day smoker. So what she was saying for me is true because I've lived that. But I don't know the services would, it would help some people, but a lot of people just like to smoke. And so, so you, 
got quite a lot of responses like that. And this is quite a nice example. I'm not going to get into the types of evidence that people find more persuasive, but generally I think people's own personal accounts did seem persuasive and to go, yeah, did seem persuasive to other jury members in contrast to some of the evidence that came from witnesses that presented stats and so on. Um, I, I said I would come back to this point. So we didn't put any policy proposals to participants that were in this category two of strengthening communities, but um, older participants in particular tended to talk about community support or, or brought it up quite a few times. And the general account that we were given that emerged in the data is that in, in a few decades, like two or three decades ago, large employers um, operated in areas and a lot of people shared the same employer and at that time the way employment work and communities work community support was really important for looking after people and import, important for um, yeah stepping in and providing support where people were encountering difficulties um, and that as employment situations had changed that and other policies changed communities are kind of broken down and that we were now lacking that kind of support and that that was a problem so that that's the that came out quite a bit in terms of spending more money on the nhs so this was a proposal i know ellen's on the call so she's probably got really interesting things to say about this but so it it um was really interesting because it it scored consistently highly but uh, in the national survey and the citizens jury individual responses. And, and they, there was a separate proposal to invest more in GP services, which also scored highly. But there was a decline in the mean values for both proposals over the course of the juries. Nonetheless, both proposals were placed in the top 10 of each jury's final group voting. And it was really interesting as, as to why that was, because Actually, in the discussions, people were sometimes quite critical of the idea that more money should go into the NHS. It, so it was contested. So people would say things like, well, we probably could do more investment in the NHS, but I think there's more than enough there or there's nearly enough there. Um, but we're constantly mopping up a bath that's flooding instead of trying to turn the tap off. So, so people did raise questions about it. But there was also this thing going on that sometimes when people talked about the NHS, it was almost as if they equated the NHS with health. And you see that a little bit in this extract here. So I think the NHS is top. So they're explaining why they think it should be the top proposal. Because other than family and friends, your health is the most important thing. And that statement kind of only really makes sense if you're really equating the NHS with health. Um, Proposals to invest more in social housing, in marked contrast to this, I think here participants had a really clear account in all three juries of why social housing was important for health. And, and it kind of went through the um, pathway that I described in the metaethnography. So people talked about how it impacted on, on different things. Um, it was supported by national survey and jury members in individual questionnaires. Support, jury support increased slightly over time, and it was included in the top 10 proposals of all three juries in their group voting. Dis discussions often felt like featured quite poignant accounts. So this one saying a lot of damp houses and houses that are not really suitable for people or fam are not really suitable for people or families. So if, if you're subjected to a lot of that and a lot of poverty, it's like a vicious cycle, really. You're just going to really focus on living it. You're not going to really focus on living a better life. So therefore, <clears throat> your eating habits are not going to be managed very well and so on. And then complementing these accounts, there was a clear articulation of the roots fire, which improved housing could make a difference. So this um, person saying, maybe we should think about a starting point really from the bottom and working up. So before we provide more jobs for people, make sure the national minimum wage is increased. And before we stop, uh, try to stop people from smoking, let's make sure that they've got more money for social housing so they're happier. So they're happier, they're taking on a new outlook on things to try and stop them from being unhealthy. And that really kind of aligns with the research on the social determinants of health. There was a lot of discussion in the juries about, well, if you want to do these things, improve living and working conditions, you've got to raise funds for it. And that's something we could discuss in the juries, which you couldn't really discuss um, in the national survey. So there was a lot of discussion about different kinds of taxes. There was a proposal they had to introduce higher taxes for richer people. Um, average support was just below four in both the national survey and all three time points in the juries. But over 50% of the participants across time points either agreed or strongly agreed with the proposal, and it featured in the top 10 of, the, of two of the juries. That it's, so it's a bit of a mixed picture. So it's, it's got a lot of support, but it was also contested. And that was um, 
evident in the jury discussions. So this person's saying, for me, increasing tax for rich people is definitely number one, way before everything else, apart from the fact that um, a fellow juror and I just actually, one topic we came up with first was out of the first seven proposals, six of them were saying spend. Has anyone thought about where that money's coming from? It's got to come from somewhere like that. And, and then someone else saying, yeah, well, we think if you work hard to get to the top, why take your wages off you and bring you down? I don't think that's right. So it, these discussions tended, you didn't see, get the sense that people were changing their opinion. It tended to be connected to, to their innate sense of, of what was fair. There were some really interesting discussions at the sideline, particularly of one jury, where people were talking about what counts as rich in this proposal. It's unclear. All of the juries discussed this to some degree. In one um, jury, I think it was a Glasgow one, a participant very strongly said you know, £100,000 a year isn't rich. £200,000 is maybe rich. And so that became the threshold. But there were a group of women who totally disagreed with that, that we captured in our ethnographic data, who were saying, you know, that's really not right. Like £50,000 a year is, is rich. So you saw a huge variation in how that proposal was kind of understood and interpreted. So we also had a proposal in terms of raising funds to increase the price of um, unhealthy products. So that achieved the second lowest means goal of any proposal in the national sample survey and means support um, below four across all time points in the juries. But support did increase over time in the juries. And in the group voting, the proposal was placed sixth in Liverpool, ninth in Manchester and 11th in Glasgow. So it, it did relatively well. And the qualitative analysis reveal here that um, it, it was widely discussed, highly contest, contested, but there was more effort in this case by favorable jury members to persuade others, largely on the basis of two distinct rationales. So the first was that it would be effective in reducing healthy behaviors. So there was a belief that it would be effective and, that, and they'd heard um, some examples of that. And this participant brought in sugar taxes in Mexico as an example of it being effective. The second common reason was that it was um, fair. So it was seen as fair. It was fair to ask people who are engaging behaviors that negatively impact on health to contribute more tax to, um, to society to kind of pay for services that they might be more likely to need, such as the NHS. And that framing was particularly con um, common in Manchester with one participant describing it as, as a balance of responsibility between com consumers and, and the government and society. Um, it, and it was, it increased support increased when there was an idea that you'd ring fence this money to spend on things like the NHS. A less common rationale was that it offered a means of tackling health inequalities that maintained individual choice. So, so you raise the price, but you don't reduce people's ability to choose to engage in that behavior. A few final thoughts that come from the qualitative data um, that seemed really important in our analysis. So one was, and this, so this was 2016, July. So it was just after the EU referendum um, that had, had taken place. And I was, I was worried about how um, divided people might feel coming together. The gen it, they generally didn't, it didn't come, they didn't come across really divided and they engaged really well and, and with each other and were very respectful of each other. But they really, uh, there was a very strong sense that they didn't trust government, local or national. And this is just a selection of extracts that backed that up. I, I was quite taken aback by some of, of what people said here. So this um, respondent from Liverpool saying, I, I don't really think politicians know what they're doing. The politicians, they can't do anything about it. They can't even run the country for God's sake. You know, we're lost really, aren't we? And, and uh, one in Liverpool saying, we couldn't run a bath, our local authority. One in Glasgow saying the taxes that the government take are stealth taxes just to get more money out of the public and they'll not tell you where it goes. Um, and one in Liverpool saying we're not really a democratic society because we the people don't get to vote for where our tax paying goes. So lots of distrust of government, a sense that they weren't um, very efficient, that weren't working very well, but particular concerns when it comes to raising and spending taxes um, that obviously impact on the responses um, that we've seen here. There was also resistance to being stigmatized, very much in line with the metroethnography results. So in all three groups, there was some resistance to the idea of health inequalities at different points, particularly on day one. So this is an example of someone saying, you know, their small group, we, we don't necessarily agree 100% with the fact that if you're wealthy, you're healthy, and if you're unwealthy, you're unhealthy. 
And that's obviously not what we were trying to say, what the witnesses were trying to say, but it is an issue of when you talk about averages and what's going on at the population level, it doesn't really translate to, well to people's individual experiences and can seem really disempowering and like something people want to push back on. And so we spent quite a lot of time discussing that. Um, and, and I don't think we got over that for, for some people there. There was also recurrent individualizing and fatalistic discourses, which is to be expected because they're quite um, prevalent in, in the media. So this person saying it's all up to the individual how they conduct and live their lives. If they want to eat healthy, fine. If you don't, fine. And, and, you saw, and so there was a sense from some people who had that perspective that then it just wasn't worth policymakers trying to do anything in this area at all. So pre preliminary conclusions. Um, so we've just we've just had one paper that describes some of, some of the main findings um, is under review at Social Science and Medicine, but we're planning to write up a few others. So we are still thinking about this, and feedback is really helpful. So research to understand public views of potential policy responses to health inequalities is likely to provide insights that vary by method, I think, and, and how you ask the questions. In our quantified data, the results from asking participants to complete individual questionnaires vary between the sample survey and then the jury sample, with juries um, members being more favourable towards most of the policies. And I can say a little bit about why that is, if, if, why that might be, if, if helpful. Individual responses from jury members slipped, shifted slightly over time, suggesting that people's views are malleable to a degree and may change following exposure to evidence or group discussions and deliberations. The group voting resulted in noticeably more support for upstream category three and four proposals. So that's macro policies, economic policies, changing liv people's living and working conditions than for individually focused proposals, suggesting people respond differently when working more collectively. And that's something um, <coughs> that, that is to be expected. There's quite a lot of um, kind of theorizing and, and evidence of that elsewhere. So if, if people are making decisions in front of other people that they tend to suggest more collective responses than if they're um, responding individually as uh, in private. The qualitative data complicate the picture, demonstrating that one of the most popular proposals in group ranking and voting, higher taxes for richer people, was also one of the most controversial in group discussions. In contrast, a proposal that was outside the top 10 proposals in the group voting across all three juries, provide the public with more health information, was relatively uncontested in jury discussions. And then the final slide. So, so I think for me, the takeaways are, our results challenge perceptions that there's necessarily a lack of public support for the kinds of upstream policy proposals favored by many researchers. It counters previous evidence from UK, or at least it's in, it's in tension with um, previous evidence from UK research um, that there, there are differences in how the research was done and who it was done with. And it's also out of line with some Australian research on this topic. Um, nonetheless, some category four proposals, so these upstream economic ones, notably tax increases of any kind, generated substantial controversy within jury discussions. And I think it's as a result of uh, three factors. The first is um, a resistance to ideas experienced as disempowering, which is sometimes the, the idea, very idea that health inequalities exist. The second, the, these individualistic and fatalist discourses that run counter to ideas about health inequalities or that, that, that it should be reduced by policy changes. And the third is a lack of trust in local and national governments, um, which is other people have found similar things there too. And the important implications for that, for people seeking to promote evidence-informed policy responses to health inequalities, is that efforts to better communicate causes of health inequalities or the extent of health inequalities are unlikely to make much difference if we don't also have work to address these broader challenges. Thanks very much. And uh, yeah, looking forward to questions and discussion. Thanks very much, Claire. That was a fascinating uh, presentation.